The Res Chef cooking show uses everyday ingredients to make meals that are quick, healthy, and tasty. Host chefs Jody and Genevieve are young, busy moms from the Flathead Reservation. Their lives are hectic and fast-paced. Who better to share their favorite dishes? On this episode of Rez Chef, Vernon Finley and his children, Jerome and Olivia, help Jody and Genevieve prepare family fun tacos with a cultural twist. Hi, I'm Jody and this is Genevieve, and we're the hosts for Rez Chef. Today we have some special guests. This is Vernon Finley and two of his children, Jerome and Olivia, and they are going to help us make some tacos, some family fun tacos. So we'll start. We um, are heating up a pan and we're going to put in some olive oil. We're using olive oil because it's a healthy substitute. Instead of using canola oil and vegetable oil, we're using olive oil. I'm going to finely dice up some fresh garlic and put that in with the oil for a minute and then put the onions in. Putting the garlic in first flavors the oil itself and then everything else will pick up the good flavor. And we're using some of this garlic because we're going to make our own sauce, our own seasoning I mean. Um, we can use this, it's alright, it has extra sugars and salts in it though. So we're going to try to make so our own, and um, if you do want to use this, if you don't feel comfortable using your own seasoning, just use like a quarter packet. That's sometimes what I do, just use a little bit instead of the whole thing. So we'll get this going. A little bit more. And make our own. And to get the same flavor, we're going to use this Bragg's amino acid, which is a great sodium substitute. It's um, not unlike soy sauce or tamari sauce, but much healthier for you. So we'll use a little bit of this instead of the salt. And what we did was we chopped um, a large onion and um, some garlic in there with the olive oil. And we're going to use about two pounds of lean ground meat. And what are we using today? What do we have? We have some tomatoes. Do you guys know the Kootenai word for um, tomato? Koshwa. Koshwa. And um, we have some baby spinach. So do you know um, what the leaves would be? That would be lettuce. Yeah. pick. Close Good job, Jody. <laughs> and then we have some peppers. Do you guys have words for peppers in Kootenai? I couldn't think of any. Uh, and then avocados, I know they're not. Oh yeah, okay. there's those. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also, we have a mango. We're going to try mango today. And then cheese. Do you guys know cheese? Uh, Do you know it, Vernon? Well, I, um, it's a controversial <laughs> word, so. Is it? <laughs> yes. Why, because it's like cow milk or something? <laughs> no. Uh, there's a couple different words that are used for it. One uh, the Canadians use is kapatnuk, uh, uh, which is like uh, um, it's um, it's talking about curdled milk. You know, it's mm -hmm. so and that's the word that we use mostly for cottage cheese. Oh. So. And what kind of meat are we using today? This is elk burger, and you guys know how to say elk in Kootenai? What was bull elk? Oh, um. Good job. Do you know what cow elk is? Sow. Okay, Olivia. Sow. Yep. Good job. So we're going to just brown this Speak and then um, we can add some of the seasoning. Do you guys want to start cutting up some of the vegetables? Mm -hmm. We'll have you do this green bell pepper and you can do the red pepper. This and way just you want me to. what we'll do is we'll just slice it this way and then we'll chop it that way. Okay, so make it in long strips and then go the other way. Hope so. Yep, so slice it. Slice it half. Yep, down, Ow. make them into long strips. Oh, put it on. Ow. <laughs> there you go. Like this, like watch. This. See? So we're going to go down. And 
And then we'll cut it this way. For seasoning, we've got um, some, some hot tomatoes? pepper. We okay. just want to use very sparingly, unless you like a lot of heat like I do, but I'm not going to do that to you today. And we've got some oregano. And some paprika. Paprika is very mild and it kind of, but it gives it a nice rich color. And then we also have some avocados. And a trick to do the avocados, uh, once they're halved, you can cut it inside the peel. And then spoon it out. And how'd you do it now? Yep. They're just chopped up. Right Olivia. Down. This meat is browning up real nice. It smells so good. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, the Kootenai hunting? You were talking about their camps earlier, their hunting camps. Yeah, traditionally during the fall time, well, to begin with throughout the year in, in the early spring, uh, Traditionally, they would go to gather all of the foods that they would store up for the winter time, beginning with the, the plants and starting with the bitterroot early in the, the spring. Bitter. On. And then by the time it was fall was usually the hunting time, and they would go have different camps. Different families would like to camp at different places, and so the Kootenays would often camp. The, the family camps would be scattered from the Nairata area up towards Hubbard, Hubbard, where Hubbard Dam is now, and up that way towards uh, McGregor Lake, mm -hmm. and up along the Kootenai River, up to the Yak, uh, West Fisher River, up that way. And there would be different families that would be camped at different places, and so the, um, and some families preferred to, some families preferred to just go to the, uh, some of them would stay put because that was their family's right. favorite hunting camp, and others preferred to go from camp to camp and gather their, you know, I mean, they would Visit, always. Visit, social time. Though. Right, right. And dry the meat, and uh, they'd dry their meat and tan the hides. And one of the things that we was talking about yesterday was about how they used to do the, um, you know, nowadays the people who tan the hides, you always see them. They store the hides, you know, they'll, they'll get the hides and then they'll salt it and then it gets dry and then it's, you know. And then they got to get it wet again. And then they got to get it yeah. wet again. And, and the way it used to be was that, you know, they would um, tan the hide almost immediately. I mean, like while it was still fresh. They it's like it was easier it, that and way. And it was a lot easier that way, right? Hmm. Yeah, I tried tanning an elk hide and it took me a few years, but I'm never going to try an elk hide again. Deer is so much easier. When we was in um, Ushni's class at the college on hide tanning, is that where you Yeah, tanned? I did. And yeah. I went to her house and I tried to do my elk. Um, I started when I was pregnant with Olivia and she would come out and she would say, Jody, that's enough. I don't want you having that baby at my house. <laughs> so after a couple hours of scraping, she would make me stop and then we could just visit. I'm going to add some uh, organic black beans. This is a much better way to do it than using refried beans, which has a lot of um, usually extra added lard. And this one we also got. It was no salt added and it's also low fat. So it's a very healthy substitute. And um, why don't we get our pan started for to warm the tortillas up. I don't know how. And we are going to be using some corn tortillas. And we are using this as a substitute so that um, instead of the white tortillas, because the flour tortillas, they have a lot of added lard in it. And it makes them softer, but also not as healthy for you. So we're going to do the corn tortillas. And corn is a better grain to use than processed flour. But they are a little bit um, 
is stiffer, so you have to heat them so they don't use break. A olive oil with that. Okay, so they don't break when you try to fold them into your taco. So the tortillas, once they're use a little bit of olive oil and do them on both sides, it allows them to be flexible without breaking. Gives them a little bit more um, stability. And you can just stack those up as they as you do them. Good job, Olivia. You added the beans to the meat? Yes, we put the oh. beans right into the meat yeah, and cook it all together. Um, you rinse them off because they have that thick, um, what is it, it's the water that they're canned in. And so I always um, rinse them off and then I put them right into the meat so they don't burn. You know, like if you put them in a pan by themselves, they would need something to protect them from the pan. And I always just dump them right into my meat. This is a good source of fiber and so is our... Uh, baby spinach, it has a lot of fiber in there and iron. And we're going to use this instead of iceberg lettuce. It has a much higher nutritional content. Adds a little different flavor too. Spinach? Yeah, baby yes. spinach mm -hmm. leaves. And you can use other you mixed greens. That? Yeah. Yeah? I was kind Are you of... lying? No, no. <laughs> I was just thinking about, uh, well, the controversy lately about uh, the spinach. Oh, the E. coli. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was um, last summer, wasn't it? Yeah. It's much healthier unless you get some with E. coli. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a general, though, not just, <laughs> not just towards baby spinach. But yeah, like this one, it Make says... Make sure you read the ingredients and it doesn't say E. coli. E. coli. <laughs> yeah, no E. coli on the back of this. But it has, um, a serving size is three ounces, so that's about two cups. It only has 10 calories, zero fat, zero cholesterol. Um, the dietary fiber is seven grams, so that's 28% of your daily recommended fiber just from your vegetables. So that's a really good substitute. We also have, um, we're going to use mozzarella cheese today versus like a Colby Jack or a cheddar because it's a healthier cheese. I was going to ask Jerome or Olivia if they remembered what, when I was noticing the beans, would you remember what the word for beans is? Um, chamna. What is it? Chamna. And what else is called chamna? Um, wood ticks. Wood ticks, because oh. <laughs> they look the same. Oh, right. oh, how cute. So when they, you know, so when the people had to come up with words for different foods, you know, and when they first saw the beans, that's, that's what, what it, it looked, looked like. like. That's really neat. That's what, um, I know the Salish word for tires, I can't quite remember what it is, but it's um, like pruned feet. <laughs> <laughs> So where are you working right now? I'm working with the Kootenai Culture Committee. And what is uh, like your mission statement? Or well, what we primarily we're working on language preservation projects. That's what I work on, right? You know, developing curriculum. Uh, right now we're, uh, you know, getting approval to try to get to try to finish any type of publications and everything is kind of difficult because you go through the. Uh, we like to get approval of the elders, and so then yeah. there's always, uh, if you get a group of elders together, getting them all to approve something is... <laughs> is, is, is Difficult, huh? It's, it's, it, well, and necessary, you know, so... So who is your target? Like, um, who are you trying to um, do the lessons for? Primarily beginners. What yeah. do you mean, Bergen? Just, oh, so it's like People a... People wanting to learn the language. So, so anyone, any student. So anyone, right. Anyone could be a student. Right. So whoever's interested, it would be like a, the first level. Right. So you want to give us a lesson? Uh, well, mostly I, I, was, no, I was listening to when, when I was, when we was telling you some of the words, you already know a lot of the sounds, and that's one of the things that's really important. You know, we have the elders who are fluent speakers, they, um, 
but not teachers. Mm -hmm. And then we have young people who are who have the inclination to teach, but they don't have the content. They don't know right. the language, and so and. One of the biggest issues that we deal with constantly, all tribes deal with in trying to revive their languages, is pronunciation. You know, a fluent, to a fluent speaker like myself, I'm, I'm nowhere near fluent. And I know a lot, I know a lot about it, and, but my pronunciation isn't, you know, a fluent Foreign. speaker can listen right. to me and they know that, you know, I, I'm not fluent in, in the way that I, uh, Way that I speak. You have an accent, right? And the um, the you know the words just aren't aren't quite pronounced correctly, and that was one of the biggest emphases of a lot of the fluent speakers was you have to say it absolutely correctly, you know, and so that kind of uh, that's one of the issues that well, we I deal with in trying to see teach some the of the importance of it is because if you get away a little bit, then the next generation would get away a little bit further. And so, you know, four generations down the line, the word is going to sound very different than the way it started. Exactly. And that's like, that's one of the really important issues that I try to get across to people, young people who want to teach the language is how much you're going to change it. You know, all languages evolve and change, but how much you're going to do it. For example, words that came in, um, well, like um, the word for beans, what he said, something that's, you know, um, that's, one, that's one way that they come up with words is, is what, it, what it means from a cultural viewpoint. But another way of coming up with the words is to listen to the English word and then to try to pronounce it from within the language, like coffee, copy. Huh? Oh, that's like that Salish. That's Both. Copy. Is it? See, be, and, and what it is, there, there isn't an F in either, either language, right. but the closest sound to a f is a p in the, from in the language, so they said copy. And a Seth, but, Joseph. Right, so if you think about from within the language, a person who only understood the language, they hear those words, they hear a copy, it, would ha it, it wouldn't strike any type of a meaning to them. Now the other word you was using in Salish for uh, car, you mm -hmm. know, peep oishin, you know, it's wrinkly feet. Yeah. You know, so uh, now that creates an image, it's a different, creates yeah. an image in, in, in a fluent person's mind. Whereas just copying the word, taking the English word and pronouncing it in Salish or Kootenai or any native language, that changes it. Good. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Do you guys want to get some tacos together? Yeah? Start making them. Okay, what we're going to do is um, we'll give you guys your plates and your shells, your tortillas, and um, you can choose what you want on it. Maybe we should put the meat on it for them. And then you can add whatever toppings you'd like to try. We have also a couple substitutions for the toppings, so we can go over that. Um, this. We are using um, plain yogurt, and this is going to be instead of using sour cream. It's just a healthier alternative. It doesn't have all that fat. There's a tortilla. Change up. So what do you guys think of the Kootenai language? Is it fun? Eh. Yeah, my daughter, she gets that at school. Um, Tony comes in and teaches her Kootenai, and she loves it. And she always tells me the word for beaver, and she slaps her hand down, and she said, that's how you got to say it. you got to use your hands. <laughs> but, yeah, she likes Kootenai language. Do you want to? Yes, I definitely would. She goes to Polson School District. Yeah, she goes okay. to Cherry Valley. I know, I said, why don't they teach them Salish? <laughs> but I guess because it's closer to Elmo. Right. Okay. Do you guys want some leaves? <laughs> no leaves. Would you like some? Absolutely. What do you guys want? There's tomatoes and then the peppers and the mango and red pepper. Oh, and a few cheese. A few what? Cheese. Oh, just cheese. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
We also have some lime sliced up over here, which is really nice yeah, to put as, on the top. It has a nice flavor to it. My kids, they like to put ketchup on theirs. Do you guys like ketchup? No? My kids like ketchup. The tomatoes are good, and you always want to look for one that says, like, no added salt and no um, high fructose corn syrup or sugar that's added in it also. So try to get a healthy ketchup. Can I add any others? Mm. Come on, go out on a limb. <laughs> do, you like, do you like sour cream? Because this yogurt is like sour cream. That's it, huh? Do you like salsa? Mm -mm. <laughs> what do you guys eat? Cheese. They're always Cheese. minimalist, Cheese and right? Meat. meat and potatoes. Really? That's, yeah. <laughs> you know, I always um, tease them about like, um, it's like a tr traditional. I I I say traditional Kootenai. It has to be, um, you know, meat and potatoes, and to get them to venture out and to try something else is. Pulling teeth, It's huh? pulling teeth, <laughs> right. You know, it's uh, anything that looks a little different or haven't tried before, you know, it's difficult. Well, I've been lucky. Both my girls are very adventurous. They try anything and everything. They love hot sauce. They have pretty sophisticated taste buds. Cute. Sequoia passes on the ranch dressing and puts oil and vinegar on her salads oh. and <laughs> has been doing that regret, since... Huh? has been that way since she's been in grade school. Cute. She's 12 now. This is a really fun meal to make with the family. As you can see, all the kids can get in on it and help. It's a nice way to teach them, teach them how to cook. Coming along this time of year, one of the things that is always um, we're, what we're about to come up on is the the middle of the winter dances and the jump dance and the, and it's where the, um, a lot of the kids receive their names, their yeah. Indian names and everything. And so, um, and that's that's one of the things that was always that's always kind of an issue is, you know, traditionally, the way that the people would choose a name, for honest, you look back in your family, in your family tree, and you and you think about. Um, who, which individuals back there would you want your child modeled after? You know, who, who was a good person who had exemplified all the values that you like? So that and the name so then would, would associate would, with right. the person. So you name, your, you name your children after someone you want them to be like hmm. in, in the past. And so families pretty much would, uh, you could tell there would be certain words that were used for, ah. um, in, uh, okay. that, you, that you would know which family which family line they were from, just from the... Um, from their name? From, from what their name was, right. What's your guys' names? Mine is, um... I forgot. <laughs> Maybe you Dad forgot your you Indian name? Yeah, I forgot. Oh, are you too nervous? Um, oh, it's Kush Karnashakna. What does that mean? Big old man. Big old man? <laughs> You're going to have to grow into that name, huh? <laughs> What's your name, Olivia? Kokiaku. Kokiaku? Kokiaku? What does that mean? Um, burnt hand. Really? Good. See, and so when you think about their names, you know, from um, the way kids are at school, the way they want to, you know, um, uh, you think about what would be a good name, and you'd say, big old man. Why yeah. Not? Um, but, Why would you want to have that name? Right, <laughs> but um, do you do you remember who you were named after? Um, my great um, uh, uh, great grandfather. Your great grandfather. And and he was um, a, you know, a very well respected old man. He was on the tribal council. He um, was um, a spiritual man, and he um, helped a lot of people. And his home was always open, and he was yeah. always just, you know, just a real gentle, yeah. gentle old man. And so, uh, so that's, you know, um, was that his was, name as it translated, or right? Huh. And also, it it would depend. Names yeah, were also like he had a few different names because one. you would have a, a name for different. For different things now, him being a, um, a spiritual person, a medicine man, he would have a different name for when he was in 
in that realm versus more like a title <clears throat> mm -hmm. versus yeah versus the name that you use out in public and mm -hmm. in other situations a special name and his mother was Kukiyaku mm. so that's who um and she was one who um she trusted automobiles when and so she would walk. She would walk just about everywhere she went. She lived down in Dixon, and so she would go to jump dance in Elmo. And, I mean, like she would walk to <laughs> yeah, Elmo. You know, so I mean, the week before, she, huh? yeah, right. So walking the rest. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm. just to recap, um, we wanted to have a, a lot of different vegetables because vegetables are really good for your body, and we used yogurt versus sour cream because that's a healthier alternative, and we used mozzarella cheese versus a cheddar or Colby Jack, and we used the elk burger, so that's healthier than beef. And we made our own seasoning, and we're using olive oil and corn tortillas. So this is a very healthy way to make tacos, and I hope you guys had fun, and thank you for coming, and it was nice to visit with you. And we are gonna be up next. Um, uh, next week we're gonna have Kim Sweeney here. She is also a tribal member and the editor for Charcoosta News, and we're gonna make some chicken and sun-dried tomatoes with broccoli, and it's gonna ah. be good. So thank you for watching, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Res Chef is brought to you by Salish Kootenai College Community Health and Development and Ancestors Choice. For more information about Res Chef cooking shows, Ancestors Choice, the Traditional Living Challenge, or to contact the program, please call 406-275-4917.